Hey everyone, how are you doing? Como están? I'm Paul Rice. I'm founder and CEO of Fairtrade USA. Uh, if you live here in Switzerland, you've heard of Max Avalar, uh, which is um, uh, very similar to Fairtrade USA. We are a model for shared value that fights poverty and, and promotes uh, sustainable development around the world by creating value for companies and consumers. I'm very happy to be here today and to share a bit uh, of our journey, our lessons, and our challenges. And I forgot the clicker. Here we go. A ver si funciona. So, uh, once upon a time, I was a university student too. As a matter of fact, I uh, was the original Harry Potter. <laughs> as you can see. And like so many of you in this room, at the tender age of 22, I knew that I wanted to save the world. And after much reflection, I decided that the best way that I could do that was to buy a one-way ticket to Nicaragua and go join the revolution. So that's what I did. Off uh, to Nicaragua I went, thinking I would stay for a year. I wanted to work with farmers. I wanted to work on agricultural development. Uh, but I stayed for 11 years. And for the first half of that time, I was working on one well-intentioned development project after another. Projects that were developed by very smart people living in uh, capitals around the world and sending millions and millions of dollars of well-intentioned aid money to fight poverty. And yet my experience was an unhappy one because what I found was that more often than not we failed to help farmers develop their own capacity to solve their own problems. We ha failed to help farmers think about the market and learn how to navigate the market effectively. In fact, more often than not, I would argue that we simply created dependency on aid. So I grew very disillusioned with this, and in the summer of 1990, had uh, an opportunity to totally shift gears. By the way, I'm the skinny guy in the picture. Um, in the summer of 1990, I heard about these crazy people here in Europe, in Switzerland, and in England, and in Holland, who called themselves fair traders, and who were willing to pay us a dramatically higher price for our harvest if we would simply organize our farmers and sell direct. And so, captivated by this notion, I um, organized the very first fair trade co-op in Nicaragua. I was only able to pull together 20 small farmers, and so we were only able to fill one container of coffee. Um, and we shipped it to a fair trade buyer in England, and a few months later, we were paid for our coffee, and the price that we got was $1.20 per pound for our coffee. After cost, we were able to deliver back to our farmers $1 per pound at a time when the local middleman in Nicaragua was paying 10 cents per pound. Most of our farmers had one acre, that's about a half a hectare of land. They were growing maybe 2,000 pounds of coffee per year. So 2,000 pounds times 10 cents meant that they would have received $200 as a total cash income for the year. Instead, we got them $2,000. Most of them had never seen that much money in their lives. So as you can imagine, I was a pretty popular guy that year. In fact, uh, I got a new nickname, Pablo Un Dollar. <laughs> and over the next couple of years, we organized 3,000 families across all of northern Nicaragua into this co-op that was not only exporting coffee, but also uh, developing other services for farmers. So we developed a village banking program and provided credit. We bought a mill and started to process our own product and add value and increase the quality. And by virtue of the money that was coming back as a result of this direct trade, both fair trade markets and others, we were able to do things that otherwise we would have waited for government or well-intentioned NGOs to come and do for us. So we dug wells and brought clean drinking water into our villages for the first time. We built schools. We created scholarship program, programs. We ran health programs for kids. We invested in quality. We invested in productivity. All of this stuff, and none of it thanks to any agency, and none of it thanks to anyone's charity. All of it thanks to this very simple but powerful concept of a better price for a, a better product. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about Yolanda Rivera, who for me kind of captures the essence of, of this journey. 
Uh, so Yolanda, this is Yolanda on uh, her high school graduation day. That's her father, Santiago, uh, n- next to her. And Santiago uh, has um, about one hectare of coffee. Uh, he and his generation studied through second grade, learned how to read, and then was out in the fields. But Santiago had the foresight to join a co-op in the 80s, and he joined our Fair Trade Initiative in the 90s. And as a result, his village created a a high school scholarship program so that kids like Yolanda could um, stay in school. Yolanda was the first person in the history of her village to finish high school. That's her. And she went on, thanks to the support of the scholarship fund created by us, really, buying their coffee. She went on to finish university, and now she's back in the health clinic in in her village, serving her community. And every time I go back to Nicaragua, I go to visit them, and I get the update, and there's always this whole group of little girls sitting on the porch with us watching Yolanda. I used to think they were watching the crazy gringo that would show up once a year, but no, they're watching Yolanda. Because Yolanda's story is not just about her having a dream and reaching for that dream and achieving it as a result of this powerful model for change. It's also about her demonstration effect. It's about her becoming a role model for every girl in that village. And about the hope and the pride and the dignity that we are able to create, you and I, every time we buy a banana or a bar of chocolate or a cup of coffee. So... Um, after four years of leading this co-op, I, um, I um, had the first uh, of several, I'll admit, uh, identity crises in my life, and, and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I mean, I was living the life. I loved that life, working with farmers. But this fair trade model had totally shaken me ideologically and professionally. Because I'll admit, until this point, I really saw markets as the problem. I thought capitalism was the problem. And through this journey, I realized that actually, if we harness the power of the market, we actually have the most powerful force for change that we could hope to have. The most powerful force for liberating these poor farmers and empowering them on a journey out of poverty that we could hope to have. And so then for me, the question became, do I stay in Nicaragua or do I move back to the States? Fair trade has been here in Europe for 50 years and in the U.S. At that time, there was almost nothing. And so eventually, after much soul searching, I decided that my calling was to go back to the U.S. and see if I could replicate and adapt what fair traders had done here in Europe to that market context in the United States. So off I went, and um, after um, stopping by way of the University of California at Berkeley to get a, an MBA, uh, I, I founded Fair Trade USA in 1998. Never thinking that I would stay, thinking I would start it, and then move back to Nicaragua, where I belong. Uh, but here I am, 17 years later, um, still, still going strong. So Fair Trade, um, let me just explain a little bit how our venture works. We're a nonprofit organization. We don't buy or sell product. We certify products, right? So we work with companies and we certify their products. We also train farmers and help develop their entrepreneurial skill and their product quality, and we educate consumers. So it really is a shared value model. We're not trying to redistribute wealth from companies to farmers. Rather, we're trying to create value for companies and consumers in a way that that uplifts the farmers. Um, When we started, we were 100% dependent on grants and donations, um, but we very quickly realized that to thrive, we needed to develop an earned revenue model. And so we started charging the industry for the audit and certification that we do for them. And today, uh, we are 80%, so a $12 million budget, and 80% of that comes from earned revenue. Um, We have now signed over 800 uh, partnerships with companies of all kinds and sizes, from Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts, and more recently, Nespresso and PepsiCo, uh, to Walmart and and, and other companies. It's focusing first on the U.S., but now going global. And um, those companies 
by the way, have taken us far beyond coffee. So now we certify any and every kind of food, from coffee and tea to chocolate and flowers and all kinds of fresh fruits and vegetables. And increasingly, we're starting to look at non-agricultural products. Uh, we just moved into apparel last year, and uh, we're starting to look at manufactured products like um, uh, furniture and uh, carpets and home goods. And that's better. One of the first lessons in our journey was that we couldn't do it all by ourselves. And that's a hard lesson for a social entrepreneur to, uh, to learn because so many of us think that, um, that it's just about sheer will and vision. And if we have enough will and vision and passion, then we'll get it done. But um, actually, our success is absolutely um, dependent on all of the partnerships uh, with NGOs, with foundations, with companies, with farmer groups, with activists um, who have enabled the model to grow. And, you know, I think it's very easy to partner with an organization when that organization is thriving, when it's successful, um, when it's established. But it takes a lot more vision and, um, and foresight to part with, partner with an organization that's not yet successful. And um, so I like to call out Avena, the Avena Foundation, as an organization that saw us very early on and decided that we were worth betting on. Uh, in 2001, so year three of the venture, when we were still very small and unproven, the Avena Foundation gave us uh, a grant that really helped us create momentum and go to the next level. And um, as part of that process, Stefan Schmidheine reached out to me personally. I think he wanted to know who this crazy gringo Sandinista really was. Was he really Harry Potter? <laughs> and uh, that's led to a lifelong friendship uh, and mentorship that uh, has truly blessed my life. So um, we all want to know what the numbers are, right? I mean, impact is what everyone has to prove. And uh, we actually have great numbers because we track the price of fair trade products, so we know how much our farmers are selling products on when they're certified. We know what the market price is, and so that difference is a key indicator for us, the, the amount of money that we're able to generate for farmers over and above market price. And I'm proud to say that cumulatively, to date, we've generated $350 million in above market pricing for the farmers that we serve. And even better is the return on investment, because we, um, today, and, and, and over this journey, for every dollar that we've spent building this market, we've been able to generate five dollars in impact. Never did I achieve anything close to that when I was working in international development. The trajectory is, um, is ambitious. We believe that we can get to a billion dollars in cumulative impact by 2020. Uh, and we're well on our way. I think part of what has driven this growth and, and, um, and, and the development of the model is what we observe as a macro trend in the corporate world today around um, supply chain sustainability. So I think what drove many companies to work with us early on was a desire for reputational benefit or perhaps to differentiate their brands and their products from competitors. But increasingly, we're finding that leading minds in industry are rethinking their approach to the supply chain. They're no longer indifferent to where their products come from and how they're produced. They understand that long-term profitability is linked to sustainability, and linked in particular to the sustainability and security and resilience of their supply chains. And so they're looking to fair trade and other models like it as a way to get greater visibility into the supply chain, greater transparency and, and, and security. So I would identify that as a macro trend, this trend of business to inc increasingly look at supply chains and its sustainability in general um, as, as potentially a driver of profitability and long-term success. The second macro trend that I would identify is in the consumer world. I mean, as consumers, we're increasingly asking, where does our stuff come from? Consumers are increasingly asking, tell me about this product. First of all, is it safe? Is it healthy? But then also, is there child slavery? Is there, is there environmental degradation in this product? Reassure me that I'm not doing harm in the world with this product. And, and this is a macro trend. I and mean, it's not everyone yet. It's, it's still, I mean, most data in the U.S. indicates that it's 25 to 35 percent of the U.S. consumer. But it's a growth trend, and it's, and it's um, driving a shift in the way companies think about products. 
So we see those two macro trends as driving our growth until now and driving our growth into the future. So a couple of years ago, we realized that the fair trade of the past was probably not a scalable model. And that in order to go to scale and have a truly uh, grander impact in terms of shared value for companies, consumers, farmers, and workers, we needed to rethink some of our key assumptions. And you know, one of the, the key challenges for us in our movement, and perhaps for all of us in, in what we're doing, is finding the courage to challenge our own assumptions. Finding the strength and courage to challenge the ideological uh, approaches that we've been used to, uh, and the business models that we've developed and that have made us successful until now. And in fair trade, we're very much doing that today. Challenging this notion that fair trade is a small is beautiful model. Challenging this notion that fair trade is only for the small farmer and, and not for workers on big farms. Challenging the notion that fair trade is only for farmers and workers in the global south. What about farmer workers in, in California? They're just as exploited. So we're challenging our core assumptions, and I, I think that's <clears throat> absolutely uh, key to this journey. So through this reflection, we made a big, bold move in 2011. We resigned our membership from the International Fair Trade Federation. And at the Clinton Global Initiative in New York, we announced our vision for a whole new chapter in the fair trade journey, which we call Fair Trade for All. And which, in essence, is our model for innovating the model in order to achieve much greater scale and impact. Now, the three pillars, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to... Um, go through this quickly. There are three pillars to our vision. And the first one, again, goes back to the business community. How do we create value? And in particular, how do we respond to growing industry demand for sustainable supply chains? So over the last few years, we've done a lot with Whole Foods, for example. We helped them kind of peel back the curtain and identify the farms that they were sourcing tomatoes and bell peppers and other vegetables from. And by investing directly in those farms, Whole Foods is getting a much stronger supply chain that is delivering higher quality products in a more reliable way, in a cost-effective way, and that in turn is allowing them to drive value back to those farm workers. Last year we worked with Nespresso with 9,000 farm workers in, um, uh, in Colombia in, in a similar uh, initiative. The challenge here, I would argue, is metrics. We don't have a lot of good metrics for measuring supply chain security. How do you measure that in financial terms? We have clumsy tools at best today. The second pillar of our strategy is around farmer development, so really taking farmers into this century in terms of access to capital, access to uh, good management skills, uh, access to technology, and re really leveraging technology in order to facilitate farmer um, um, accessibility with information and markets. And here, I would say that uh, a core challenge is funding. Uh, you know, there, there's so much talk about impact investing and social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurs are celebrated. And yet, for those of us who have chosen nonprofit uh, organizations as our vehicle for change, the capital markets are, um, are simply um, uh, undeveloped, right? So, I mean, if I were a for-profit venture with 800 customers with the track record that we have, with the business model we have, and the wind behind our, our sales that we have, I could go out and, and raise equity capital and do a, you know, a, a growth round probably fairly easily. But as a nonprofit, um, I'm trying to raise growth capital in increments of $100,000. It's, um, it's exhausting. And, and I think that's where we are in our movement. The, the, the capital markets for social enterprise are still um, underdeveloped and uh, the tools are, are traditional and clumsy. We launched a capital campaign last year. Um, we believe we need $25 million to go to scale. We've raised the first 10 million, that's great news, but the next 15 are going to be challenging. So I think that's an illustration. Whether it's investing in farmers or investing in consumers, um, funding is, uh, remains a challenge. And finally, uh, you know, our final piece of this three-part strategy is the consumer, because at the end of the day, if the product 
doesn't sell, the model falls apart. So you have to have consumers that know what fair trade is, that want to be a part of it, that want to make a difference. That's key. And so engaging consumers, taking them on the journey, not just awareness, but uh, involvement is key. We're doing that through traditional media, through social media, through grassroots organizing. Um, and we're doing it because we believe that lasting change for farmers and workers around the world is not just about changing corporate behavior, not just about building a shared value model between companies and farmers. The consumer has to be the third equal partner in that journey. And we believe consumers are hungry for meaning. Consumers, well, consumers, we, we know that the world is full of problems. And we don't know how to get involved. We don't know how to lift our voice. We don't know what we can do. But if we can, through something as simple as a cup of coffee or a bar of chocolate, reach halfway across the world and help a family keep their kids in school, that's very empowering to us. It's very uplifting to us. And so that's why we believe that the consumer is at the heart of our theory of change. And that's why we believe that all of us through our teaching, through our enterprises, through our NGO work, through our volunteerism, and through our purchases. All of us have the ability to lift our voice and make a difference. Thank you.